to uh, commence my uh, talk today by acknowledging the traditional owners on, who's on land we're meeting today. I also like to pay my respects to elders, past and present, uh, to an Indigenous colleagues here today. Uh, welcome, and my family, and uh, Dr. Connors for taking the time to come here as well, and uh, Professor Ali for inviting me along. It was quite a coincidence, actually. Um, my wife generally travels with me everywhere, and I was—I think I was coming from a national NAIDOC um, committee meeting. I'm on the national NAIDOC committee, and um, she wasn't with me for this meeting. And uh, I went to find my seat in business class, and I always sit on the window because I hate talking to people. I don't like talk you get all these people in business class. You don't know what they do. You don't know if they're from the right or the left. So it's best to get on the window and don't talk to anyone. <laughs> and I uh, went. I, I didn't have my glass on, so I got into row three instead of row two, if I would have looked at my ticket, and in row two was Professor Ali, and I said, mate, you're in my seat. He was on the window, and uh, he said, no, mate, he said, I'm on the window, and I, then I read my ticket, and I, I was actually on the aisle, and um, so I had no talkies with him for about half the journey, which is only about half an hour, because it's only one hour flight, and then we started talking, and he was on his way back from South Africa, where he, was, where he gave a paper, and, um, and then I... Uh, found out a bit more about, about uh, SMI and, uh, and the good work that you're doing. And then, of course, um, uh, we got chatting and he asked me to come along and give, a, give a, a paper as part of the seminar series, so I'm, I'm, gr I'm grateful uh, to have uh, uh, arrived here today through that innocuous meeting on the, uh, in business class on the way from Sydney to Brisbane. So anyhow, I'm here now and this paper I'm going to give today um, uh, is different from the usual run-of-the-mill talk about native title and and all the hassles people have in native title. Uh, I was involved in, uh, in in my past. Well, I'm currently uh, my wife and I currently have a business called First Nations Telegraph, and it's a it's a 24/7 news uh, e-newspaper. And I in my past life I was also editor of the National Indigenous Times. I did a story on some of the mining companies in Pilbara, and. I was really amazed at the, uh, the, the level of negotiations or hardballing of, of mining executives, the moguls with the traditional owners. Um, there's, like, there's one tribe in particular where on their land they've got several mining companies, the big ones of course, uh, uh, they're all after the iron ore. And one, uh, one particular mining executive or mogul wanted to give a flat rate of $4 million to the traditional owner group to mine forever. That was a one-off payment and they could mine on their land forever and, and export their iron ore to Port Hedland and then uh, to India and China and wherever else they send their iron ore. But another group they, they negotiated with, negotiated on a flat, on, on a, uh, a rate of iron ore uh, carried on the trains through their land as well as extracted. And that rate uh, gave the, um, the traditional owner group as much as 20 million a year and it varied depending on the price of iron ore. And I, I was quite fascinated by the discrepancy of, of someone who could earn 20 million. If someone asks you, would you like 20 to 25 million for the rest of your life or a flat rate of 4 million, I, I guess you'd have to be Einstein to work at what rate they'd go for. But the fact that it's possible in Australia to have that level of negotiation over the same mineral extracted from the ground uh, really, really uh, amazed me. Now everyone knows that Western Australia gets the best deals. But in Queensland, I've seen settlements in Queensland where Aboriginal people, um, particularly in the oil and gas industry, receive as much as a couple hundred thousand dollars for uh, uh, recompense for their for mining on their land. Yet another company recently, the traditional owner group, negotiated a settlement of 110 million, and they weren't extracting minerals from their land. They just negotiated the um, the the end of the, of, of the line with the export of the liquefied gas. So once again, you, you see in Queensland where you can get a couple hundred thousand to allow people to come in and dig up your ground or sink big pipes in your ground to get oil and gas. And look, uh, I'm not against mining by any stretch of imagination. If it's done in good faith and it's uh, equitable and, and just, then that's fine if the traditional owners want that. But I'm more concerned about how people arrive at these settlements. Now, my paper today isn't about all the juicy parts about all that. I don't see any journalists in the room, but I'm not going to talk about or name any of the moguls. I think you've got a pretty good imagination can picture who, the, who I'm talking about. My paper, um, a formal paper, is about the end result. Why do we have these problems in the native title industry? Why is there such 
um, you know, discrepancies in negotiations. And I traced it right back to the elephant in the room, and that is racism. And in the context of this paper, it's about whiteness. And hopefully by the end of the 45 minutes um, talk, you'll understand what whiteness is about. I'm, I'm sure most of you academics would know what whiteness is about. But from, a, from the perspective of an indigenous person, what whiteness, uh, the impact of whiteness on um, the original decision making in terms of settlement from 1788 right through to the present and how it's still impacting at the same level um, with the same intent as some of the people who, who came in and, uh, and colonised this country, brutally colonised this country back in 1788. So with, uh, with those few uh, introductory comments, uh, I'll start my paper. And of course the headline is the whiteness of native title, a personal perspective. So within the personal perspective, I'll be talking about a lot of things that I've done that um, relates to uh, my experiences with whiteness specifically, but more broadly with uh, racism. So if the world was populated with only green people, then they may not have had the need for the 1992 Marble, Marble High Court judgment that debunked the myth of terra nullius and gave us the 1993 native title legislation with all its resultant malignant flaws. But knowing today the edifice of the structured society and the politics of people's predilection to rule and govern others, as, in, as Indigenous Australians are all patently aware of, someone would have classified groups into various shades of green, and of course the lightest of green would rule and the darkest of green would commence life with a formidable handicap. I believe in time the light green people would have invented the N-word, along with a plethora of other lazily inventive but equally vile descriptors, to demean the darker green people of that community. Using the nigger, abo and coon words to keep them in their place would have been the catchphrase of the master green race. African American novelist James Baldwin, in putting his case forward uh, that there is no such thing as whiteness or for that matter blackness or more generally race, argues no one is white before he or she came to America. It took generations and a vast amount of coercion before this became a white country. In his, provo in his provocative reasoning, Baldwin challenged his readers to examine the very nature of the construction of the systems, uh, systems of privilege and oppression, which socio sociologists call social construction of reality. Through the study of whiteness theory, I'm able to juxtapose racism and xenophobia to produce a constant theme of white privilege and power that has produced and sustained a white bias in all aspects of Australian life. That implicitly flows over to the functionality of native title. Whiteness theory explains not only the whiting out of Australia's shameful black history, but the ease in which successive governments since Federation have conveniently applied the myth of terra nullius for justification of its brutal conquest of Aboriginal lands without the need for recompense. It is my position that in having a broad awareness of the term whiteness allows a window of, op of opportunity for avid followers of native title to clearly view and appraise its inherent and subliminal imperfections. Once those native title limitations are made obvious, it is then and only then that those weak points of the actual workings of the Keating government's legislative masterstroke can be addressed and progress of justice and equity be realised. A number of views of whiteness exist in the literature. Whiteness emerged as a focus of academic study primarily in the United States as early as the 1980s. White Women, Race, Matters and Social Construction of Whiteness by Ruth Frankenberg and The Wages of Whiteness by David Rodiger are two seminal books that highlight whiteness theory. Eminent feminist scholar um, so eminent feminist scholar Frankenberg on the one hand examined white women's thought about interracial relationships as idea and the racial and racialized construction of masculinity, femininity, identity and the community that flow from the dominant discourse against interracial relationships. Rodiger on the other hand writes on experiences of the white working class, principally men, through an analysis of the role of race in defining how white workers look not only at blacks but at themselves, the pervasiveness of race the complex mixture of hate, sadness and a longing in the racist thought of white workers, the relationship between race and ethnicity. While 
While Frankenberg and Rodgers' influential books fo uh, focus essentially at whiteness from gender-specific angles, Peggy McIntosh's emphatic essay, White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, credited as one of the first articles written by a, a white person on the topic of whiteness, studied white people as a distinct group and made salient references to their subliminal privileges as an invisible package of unearned assets which I can count on cashing in each day <coughs> but about which I was meant to remain oblivious. Zeus Leonardo, in appraising McIntosh's view on conferred dominance, makes a crucial point that it is possible to discuss dominance, uh, conferred dominance because there are existing structures of domination that recognise such benefits, albeit unearned. For these unearned privileges to be cashed in at societal level, there must be subliminal social structures that recognise and offer a place of vantage. A normativity of whiteness in rural Toowoomba, where I live, was patently obvious with the acceptance without challenge of Edward Stanley Brown's hideous nickname, Nigger, hanging authoritatively as a public epithet back in the early 1960s. Such was a political landscape devoid of social compassion for others. However, the notion that his nickname is time-honoured in the 21st century when the rest of the world is championing the rights of its non-white citizens, including the election of Barack Obama in 2009 as the first ever African-American President of the United States of America and re-elected in 2012, is a historic problem requiring investigation of a social audit magnitude. Those social structures that condone the maintenance of the commandingly racist epitaph in Toowoomba in the 21st century speaks volumes of the community immersed in whiteness and still frozen in time. Cynthia Levine Rasky described whiteness as being more than the sum total of white privilege, white power, white ethnicity. It is a phenomenon produced by and productive of social contests of power. Australia's leading Indigenous scholar on whiteness, Professor Aileen Morton Robinson, in her influential publication, Talking Up to the White Woman, Indigenous Women and, Feminiz and Feminism contends. White race, privilege and the oppression of Indigenous women, men and children were legitimate, legitimated by the state and were connected to property and power. And, that, and in that vein of racial fractionation of why and how, in theory white race privilege would, will remain uninterrogated as a site of domination because whiteness is not positioned as racial location and identity. The subliminal cohesive influence of Toowoomba civic leadership through its vast resources of finance, law and media has endured the acquiescence of whiteness to many Indigenous residents. It has changed little since 1840 when Patrick Leslie became the first white man to settle in the Darling Downs on the lands of the Jagawa, Gaibal and Yarrow peoples. The conferring of dominance alluded to by Leonardo on the development of McIntosh's whiteness narrative had seamless fertile grounds in Toowoomba. Here, recognised structures of dominance that cultivate the sprouting seeds of racial intolerance are unmistakable. Tony Koch, a Molly Award winning chief reporter of The Australian, refer refers to Toowoomba as God's waiting room, where a lot of rural people, graziers and all come to live in acknowledgement of the number of aged care and health services on offer for the aged. Toowoomba, like all towns and cities in the nation, I contend is fortified by political and social conservatism that functions as a subliminal enabler for more insidious acts of whiteness to thrive and challenged in the main by its majority white populace. Throughout my long decade long co uh, court case, those subliminal structures of dominance dispersed adverse consequences to my family, my supporters and me. My audacity to mount a legal challenge in 1999 against Toowoomba's conservative civil leadership civic leadership to remove the offending word nigger from the ES nigger grandstand provoked a reaction that can be best summed up through the commanding words of eminent African-American feminist Bell Hooks. Black people working or socialising in predominantly white settings whose very structures are informed by the principles of white supremacy who dare to affirm blackness, love of black culture and identity do so at great risk. James Baldwin speaking on the same thread of the perils of nonconformity of Hooks' contends. The victim who is able to articulate the situ situation of the victim has ceased to be the victim. He or she has become a threat. Resonates fittingly 
to my role as applicant in my decade-long legal campaign to remove the N-word from the public avatar. By advancing the dispute, the dispute of, uh, to the level of litigation, after my request to remove the sign was declined by the Toowoomba Sports Ground Trust, I raised the ire of white civic leaders to new heights. The unprecedented alliance of black and white leaders united for the sole purpose of marginalising me, the black litigant against the sports board, comprising respected local civic leaders, added to the whiteness intrigue on a, on a whole new level. Lips contends Aggrieved community, communities of colour have often curried favour with whites in order to make gains at each other's expense. The power of whiteness depended not only on white hegemony over separate, separate racialised groups, but also on manipulating racial outsiders to fight against one another, to compete, to compete with each other for white approval, and to seek the rewards and privileges of whiteness for themselves at the expense of other racialised populations. Frankenberg, Frankenberg refers to those who chose not to see race as an issue of, as exhibiting colour blindness, which he describes as a mode of thinking about race organised around an effort to not see, or at any rate, not to acknowledge race differences. The Indigenous local leaders' support of the, lo of the Toowoomba Sport Ground Trust in legal proceedings was instrumental in their domestic court successes. Indigenous leaders who proffered a contrary voice on the issue of race or difference were choosing to be selectively engaged and de-emphasised in order to remain in favour with the white support, support, uh, supporting, sorry, supporting associates and to acquire a spin-off privileges that may result in that association premised on loyalty. It is the interaction and contradiction, Joseph Williams contend, of the master narrative and the dominant society reality that they believe contributes to the societal reality that we, be we believe contributes to society's resonant silence and paralysis of fear about confronting issues of race, racism, white privilege and white supremacy. Whiteness in Toowoomba, as a consequence of their paralysis of fear about confronting issues of race, effectively unified disparate white people who characteristically were divided on income and status lines into a quasi-coalition of uh, homogeneity. Meredith J. Green et al. asserts, whiteness is often as, as homogeneous identity of allied white people. This tends to obscure ethnic differences among white people and to induce false sense of oneness and sameness. Richard Dye, in addressing the issue of shifting borders and, and internal hierarchies of whiteness, argues, because whiteness carries such rewards and privileges, the sense of a border that might be crossed and a hierarchy that might be climbed has produced a dynamic that has enthralled people who have had a chance of participating in it. By conveniently viewing me as a common foe allowed for the amalgam of white people with the less privileged whites enjoying the thought of being privileged without actually feeling privileged. But paradoxically, feeling comfortably located in that social category on their sole redeeming feature of being white. <coughs> Johnson argues individuals receive privilege only because they are perceived by others as belonging to privileged groups and social categories. That era of white supremacy is best summed up by Bell Hooks, who said, We are collectively asked to show our solidarity with the white supremacist status quo by overvaluing whiteness by seeing blackness as solely as a marker of powerlessness and victimisation. The fact that I didn't feel inferior in person or thought to the allied power base of white civic leadership ensured I would be in constant conflict with them during my decade-long legal campaign and indeed for the rest of my life. Perhaps this contentious debate and costly legal consequence may not have occurred if antagonist to my, legal, my campaign to remove the offending N-word from a public epitaph uh, had taken Hooks's advice when she argues, when she urged whites and blacks to decolonise their minds. By denying that racism exists, white people involved in my public campaign generally, and civic leaders and judicial officers specifically, had inadvertently become engaged with and embroiled in blatantly racist case. Johnson's contention that denying that privilege exists is a serious barrier to change explains how the N-word case has spiralled out of control with little effort on the respondent's part at negotiating a compromise. I admit that I have exhibited a predisposition to racial bias 
at heightened times of xenophobic imposition in words or aggressive physicality by non-Indigenous person or persons. But in the main I am comfortable in my self-identity as a colourly man who is the equal of any person from any race who I have caused to come in contact with. Further, that I can handle all that confront me in life's daily challenges without the need to play the race card as the answer to my failings and insecurities, if and when they occur. I also preface this paper by saying that my predisposition to racial bias towards non-Indigenous Australians on occasions is shaped by the nurturing process of my family, relatives and associates combined with my lived experience of all that's, that I've encountered. That is why I can say with confidence that all white people, including judicial officers and those working in native title, have the same predisposition to racial bias in their daily lives and vocational pathways towards Indigenous Australians are shaped also by their nurturing process of their family, relatives and associates, combined with their lived experiences of all that they have directly or indirectly encountered with First Nations people. The principal question to this accession on my part and that of the readers who may feel affronted by it is, to what extent does inherent racist sentiments affect and inform your daily decision making? Queensland squatter T.J.M. Scallon's prophetic words penned in, in his 1901 essay, Aboriginal Hereditary Ingratitude, best sums up ingrained racism that he believed may have existed from both black and white Australians in that era. It is therefore a question of speculation whether the Queensland blacks are the lowest type of blacks in the world or whether the hereditary biased prejudice they have against ourselves is the result of inhumanity to man handed down by their forefathers, which may account for the ingratitude of the present generation. Bell Hooks best sums up my familial and political investment in the N-word controversy when she refers to the power slogan, the personal is political, is political. That is, often interpreted as meaning that to name one's personal pain in relation to structures of domination was not just a beginning stage of the process of becoming too politically consciousness, too awareness, but all, all that was necessary. In taking my legal challenge and turning it deliberately into a political campaign explained why many white people feel uncomfortable with me. Many whites are not comfortable with black economic progress, argues Green Son et al, because it represents loss of white power and loss of the savage subject which, under the colonial power relationship, was rendered the property of his or her white masters. Lips argues there is more to whiteness than just attitude. This is about assets as well as attitudes. It's about property as well as pigment. It does not stem primarily from personal acts of prejudice by individuals and from shared social structures that skew access to resources, opportunities and life chances along racial lines. As a baby boomer, I still have evocative childhood memories of my humble beginnings being raised by a displaced traditional owner parents in the fringe camp situated politically and strategically by white civic leaders between the sewage treatment works and the town cemetery in the segregated rural community of Kunnamulla in southwest Queensland in the early 1960s. These civic leaders have shared social structures that facilitated racist bylaws to support their privileged vantage point by locating the blacks out of sight, out of mind. <coughs> Atkins, Taylor et al. argues socioeconomic exclusion and political marginalisation of Indigenous Australian life continues in large part because it is out of sight of white Australians. I'm cognizant that I still carry the invisible scars today of the evil disconnect of normalised whiteness that immersed Kunnamulla's non-Aboriginal population back then. Ironically, the word started in the context of my surname Hagen with the union of an attractive charcoal black-skinned cuddly woman and her suitor, a besotted ivory-white complexion Irishman. The inimitable love affair of a black woman and a white man against an overtly racist community backdrop speaks volumes of the pervasiveness of bigotry that has waned little with the passing of 220 plus years of shared experience in this country. My, mater my paternal grandfather's name was Albert H Joseph Hagen. His father was an Irishman named Joe Hagen. His mother Trella was a full-blood Aboriginal woman from the Cullerley tribe, born where Bulladown Station is now situated west of Thargaminda. Like her ancestors who had lived off the land for 
hundreds of thousands of years prior to white occupation, Trella was a proficient hunter-gatherer as a young girl, having been well nurtured by her mother and aunties on the ways and custom of her people. But as a woman, and with the sudden arrival of a roguishly handsome Irishman, Joe Hagen, on the scene, her life was about, <coughs> was about to undergo a profound change that would leave an indelible legacy for her and her descendants to follow. <coughs> How did Joe Hagen come in contact with a cuddly woman living on her traditional land amongst her people? Over lunch with Joe Hagen's grandson John Barton in my hometown of Toowoomba, I was informed that his mother's father was from County Cork in Ireland and arrived in Australia on the ship Castle in 1849. John told me Joe Hagen changed his surname from O'Hagen to Hagen when he arrived in Australia. He also added that although he came from County Cork to Australia, his family has roots in County Tyrone where they were noted horsemen. On doing further research on the O'Hagen name, I discovered the O'Hagen name derived from the pre-10th century Gaelic O'Hagen, meaning little flame, flamboyant fire from the sun, being derived from the Ode and the pagan sun god Og, meaning young. They are the male descendant of Ode, of the pagan god, a personal name meaning fire. It was Joe Hagen's arrival in far southwest Queensland where he was doing the mail run and contract fencing jobs from South Australia where he once owned, owned the property Elton Downs that brought him in contact with Trella, my great great grandmother. <coughs> His partnership with Trella mixed the Irish Hagen bloodline with the Cully uh, traditional owner bloodline and in so doing added colour and intrigue to their only child together and their descendants down that singular bloodline. John shared with me knowledge from his mother and her father, <coughs> the same Joe, Irishman Joe Hagen, and how he'd met her mother, Blanche Gadden, when he was working his, as mailman in Western Queensland. I had no information um, of the cause of Treller and Joe's separation, except his time with her produced my grandfather, his first child, before his marriage to Gadden, whom he had a further 13 children. Clearly, Treller and Joe's relationship resulted from an unplanned contact of unforeseen circumstances in a time where such partnerships were rare and when noted frowned upon by the authorities and mainstream society. What is even more lucid is the fact that Joe Hagen readily agreed to the use of his surname and Christian name as a middle name for the birth of his first child he read on my grandfather's birth certificate, Albert Joseph Hagen. I'm not sure if, just, if Joe Hagen was aware when he first met Trella that she was living on her traditional lands, on her people's sovereign territory, and not in Queensland they read on his map. Rivers, mountain ranges and other topographic markers are still used as visible boundaries for, uh, for traditional owners groups around the nation today, as they were from time immemorial. But that all changed when white man fence, rock markers took over as official boundaries of private public and, public and state borders. Post-British First Fleet arrival in Botany Bay in, on 24 January 1788. A week after Captain Arthur Phillips set foot on sovereign soil on traditional owners on the land of the traditional owners of Sydney, the Aurora people, he planted a flag at Sydney Cove to claim the land for King George III. Ob oblivious to the fact Aboriginal people probably numbered about 300,000, divided into 500 tribes, each with its own territory, language and customs, were here for eons before his claim of discovery. Aboriginal leader Lois Lewitcher O'Donoghue on offering an Indigenous perspective on Aboriginal density of First Australians pre and post co uh, contact with white settlements contends. In 1788, when White Australia was founded, Aboriginal people, my people, were a vigorous nation, perhaps one million strong. By 1901, we were largely disp dispossessed and de demoralised remnants, locked away and reserved under the control of the government as a dying race of no real account. Marut, one of the last survivors of the Botany Bay tribe, vividly recalled the devastating impact of Arthur Phillip and his first fleeters, who decimated his tribe of 400 when they arrived in 1788 to 4 by 1845, through the introduction of alcohol, disease and random killings. It was from this backdrop of mistrust of strange white intruders that Treller's ancestors first heard of through traditional modes of communication and then witnessed firsthand the calamitous impact of uninvited impositions to their culley lands that she was, a, she was to confront in the latter part of the 19th century. <coughs> Joseph Hagen wasn't the slightest bit concerned about the traditional or white man boundaries 
or what other white folk he lived amongst in far southwest Queensland thought of his black female companion back then, he would be sodded with Trella and the affection was reciprocated. The government at the time, however, frowned on mixed relationships. They considered marriage between white men and blacks as degrading to the man, although in nearly all cases the man is of the very low type. The mongrel uh, children of the mixed relationships were deemed by officials to have little hope of reaching adulthood. It was their belief that in all probability the half-caste would degenerate and become extinct. <coughs> Social Darwinism influenced the thinking of leaders in Australia in that era as it did with leaders all over the world. Aboriginal people, it was believed, were doomed to die as an inevitable part of human process of evolution, said Clark. Such belief may also have also justified the support and covering up of the many massacres of Aboriginal people that occurred throughout Australia subsequent to white colonisation. I am testimony as the third generation of a black-white union to the fact that the mongrel mixtures didn't degenerate and become extinct. However, there were many instances where Aboriginal women were deplor deplorably mistreated and weren't afforded the same respect of white men such as Joe Hagan. On the cattle stations, the Aboriginal women is usually at mercy of anybody. From among the white staff and locked up at night to keep the women from their own people. In 1900, a station owned by the Queensland National Bank had eight or nine gins fenced in with rabbit proof netting next to the house. One man sent a gin away with the mailman to Burke Town to be sent south to some of his friends as a slave. Parties of men used to go out to capture gins. These women were traded between stations. The government reported in 1900 state that women were handed around from station to station until discarded to rot away with venereal disease. The Aborigines fiercely resisted this slave trade. A magistrate reported, every murder that occurred in the coast was due to the carrying off of gins and a select committee was told, in the matter of kidnapping gins, you cannot control white men and it is the cause of half the murders committed by blacks upon them. I know from speaking to family and members that Trello was spared the indignity of being a victim of the heinous people smuggling that occurred in Queensland by sadistic men in around the time of her son Albert was born in 19, 1895. The thought of such barbaric acts perpetrated on Aboriginal women in that era is repulsive in the extreme. However, in the context of this paper on whiteness and native title, the frequency and savagery of sexual exploitation of Aboriginal women is elucidating in its unpardonable commonality. The prevailing attitude of white women of that era, or at least from the vast majority of white men, was that any female of non-European stock was less than human, and fair game in a relatively new British colony with conspicuously obvious white women deficit, and in which whiteness was valued above any other quality in settlers. Marshall Langton argued the Australian frontier was notably masculine one and miscegenation with Aboriginal women was common. One of Australia's first international Aboriginal activists, Anthony Ferdinand, who lived and protested for Aboriginal rights from 1912 to 1942 in Vienna, Austria, London, Switzerland, Rome, London, where he lived and later died in 1942, noted from personal observation that police were using their role as protectors of Aborigines to their own advantage in ways being replicated across Australia. Access to Aboriginal women was another element of their abusive power as indicated by the number of mixed descent children and the prevalence of venereal disease. The sexual exploitation of women and girls was part of the settler regime from which white men benefited more generally. Morton Robertson, whose words in a contemporary setting gives credence to its prophetic reflection of early contact years, comments, Australia has a history of prof uh, preferring and privileging the, those people who have white skin <coughs> and do not value Indigenous people. Indigenous people are con conscious of how white skin privilege works because they have lived within the constraints of whiteness. Living with whiteness means being less being treated as less than white, not entitled to an equal share in Australian society or conscious, consciously knowing that white cultures do not respect, value or view as legitimate our knowledge and rights. Trella, my great-grandmother, would have been well versed by her mother and aunties on her standing in the white societal pecking order, a motley collection of bush-hardened local residents and desperate transients seeking a change of fortune of being at the bottom rung of the social ladder. 
eminent Aboriginal leader, Luigi O'Donoghue, asserts, Aboriginal people were considered to occupy the lowest rungs of the human evolutionary ladder, which, last century and earlier this century, justified the destruction of much Aboriginal culture in the inevitable march of civilization. For all I know, she, like her mother and father before her, may not have ventured more than a couple of hundred kilometres in any direction from their birthplace in their entire life, as a clan within the tribe prior to white occupation. There was travel to other parts of the Cully Nation, some hundreds of kilometres from the southern parts of Bullagree Swamp land, south of Bulladown Station Homestead in northern New South Wales, to the eastern boundaries of Mount Margaret Station in the far north of their traditional lands, for intra-tribal ceremonies as well as to important cultural exchanges with neighbouring tribes. What I do know is that my grandfather Albert Hagen was born at Japunga Tank on the 25th of July 1895. Japunga Tank was, remote, was a remote community situated in northern New South Wales within close proximity of the Queensland border near Wumpa Gate. There was never any dispute from other tribes about the boundaries of their land. Dad talks about talks of a battle uh, told to him by his father around the sand hills in the west of Bulladan Station between Wonkomara and Cullerley, but that was not a dispute over boundaries, but rather a failed attempt at land usurpation. A bit like what the colonisers attempted and eventually succeeded at doing on the same contested past of land in later life. In times of drought there were reciprocal rights to land to share water and food with neighbouring tribes. The Madagany in the northeast, the Budgety in the southeast, the Bontamara north and the Wonkamara west. Cully tribal boundaries extend along and between the Bulu and Wilson rivers. It includes Mount Margaret Station on the north of Bulladan Station in the south. Nakadung Station occupies the western parameter and Ardock Station comes within our eastern boundary. The dimensions of the land of the Cully are quite substantial. 300 square kilometres is a vast tract of land in any man's language. It was a parcel of land that created enormous interest equally for both the white man and the neighbouring black man. One group sought the land for agricultural purposes and supremacy, whilst the other marauding group just for dominance. However, the white man had the means and the resources to attain the land more expeditiously than any of his earlier competition. In the decades that followed European occupation of Australia, there was a massive push inland by settlers in search of farming land for their sheep and cattle. As large herds of sheep and cattle travelled vast distances inland, they managed to destroy irreplaceable native flora and grassland with their hard hooves. These settlers didn't show the same level of empathy as Joe Hagen to the original inhabitants as they ventured west and forcefully conquered those in their path. Word would have reached the colourly leaders of the ghost-like people with their strange animals heading in their direction. Just like the telephone today, the original owners of the land had a simple yet effective means of communicating via the message stick delivered in person by fit young runners. The colourly people could not have envisaged the ferocious speed and effectiveness of the conquest of their land by tenacious and politically motivated white men. Although the colourly warriors offered pockets of resistance, with their innate bush cunning and combat tactics whilst armed with boomerangs and spears, there were ultimately no contest to white men on horseback deploring more advanced weaponry and battle-hardened military strategy to achieve their objectives. I often wondered if the first Europeans to land in Australia would have treated its original inhabitants as brutally as the British if they had succeeded in establishing a colony more than 182 years earlier. In 1606, the Dutch ship Dauphin, helping to establish the Dutch Empire in the East Indies, ventured south to see what spoils could be won, and reached the Australian coast. In what was a smallish ship, two masted with eight cannons, Dauphin first stood off the Mapuan territory, but every attempt to land was opposed by hostile Aborigines with spears in their hands. Moving 130 miles south, they were permitted by the Arakuan people to build a settlement. However, after they took wives of the Aborigines and forced the men to work for them, fighting broke out. The Dolphin, having lost nearly half its crew, was forced to leave Australia. However, in the early 1800s, the introduction of the mounted native police from tribal lands hundreds of kilometres away, who were trespassed with no allegiance to or sympathy for the groups whom they were deployed, and having bushcraft skills greatly superior to their officers, 
they were unleashed on the frontier people with devastating results. The black troopers were engaged in unprovoked killing of their people and although they were, there were complaints by white settlers about their callous acts, in most cases the authorities simply turned their backs on the murders. It was to their advantage to use mounted native police to lessen the level of resistance from hostile natives to, uh, to their chartered vision of settling new territories for the colony's ever increasing population. The use of native police was an extension of a similar strategy introduced all over the world by experienced colonists in dealing with indigenous people to divide and conquer or simply disperse. Argues, um, Reynolds argues, Elsa Elder argues native police rationale in Australia for killing small numbers of Aborigines was always self-defence as, as they rarely killed in large numbers. Likewise in the United States, Native American sewer Leedy, Sue Leedy, Chief Sitting Bull, who rose to prominence in the Sioux warfare against whites in the Battle of Little Bighorn, where George Armstrong Custer and his men were defeated and killed on June 25, 1876, was killed in 1890 after returning from self-imposed exile in Canada by Native American police on a charge of resisting arrest. The Native police, minus their uniform, would have been welcomed around the campfire of any Aboriginal tribe if requiring food and shelter, Aboriginal people by their nature were gentle, altruistic people and would have had no hesitation in sharing their food and water with strangers in need. Unfortunately, these Aboriginal assholes were not in need of food and lodging. They were brutal puppets for their sadistic white masters. Elder writes of the, writes of the sadistic aftermath of native police presence north of my birthplace, Kanamala, along the Warriga River where there was an unprovoked massacre at Pigeon Creek in 1862. However, in the case of the pastor Blagden Chambers, who invited the native police to his property to frighten the locals away, ironically became their protector. Chambers, after witnessing the slaughter of innocent Aborigines by the native police, intervened to, fur to, uh, to prevent further carnage. The following day, Chambers rode out of the site of the mass to the site of the massacre and recorded the full scale of the sad slaughter. The mother of the baby had been shot in the head by a bullet, which had clearly been fired by a person on horseback. In the scrub, where the native police and had been, while Chambers and Jim had been freeing the women, they found more, five more bodies of males, and at intervals for the next five kilometres they found a further eleven bodies. There was evidence that some of the men had been wounded and then viciously beaten to death. In total, the, nat the native police, without any controls from the white lieutenant, had killed 25 males ranging in age from around 16 to one grey-haired old man, who Chambers estimated as probably being nearly 80. Only one woman had been killed. By the creek they found a teenager whose leg had been broken. Further west, with a steady stream of parcels into the area, the Kalali, like all other tribes, continued to experience a poignant breakdown of their culture and customs by forced relocation of their tribe. The personal upheaval changed forever the equanimity of the Kalali peoples in dealing with their neighbouring tribes as they sought refuge on their land out of the reach from white man's relentless expansion. For eons, the Kalali people lived in multiple clan units on a defined land mass, but that life lifestyle was changed spectacularly by the arrival of armed men on horseback. The attacks on the Kalali people were unyielding and they suffered almost to the point of extension at the hands of white man's rifle. Vincent Dowling, the owner of Thargamond Station, was killed, according to white history, by Aborigines while mustering stock on the Sandhill country. As a reprisal, troopers from the troopers found the tribe camped on the eastern side of the river, chased them towards the hills, shooting them down as they ran. It was reported that 300 people were killed in this incident. McKellar asserts, other massacres that are well remembered by Kalali descendants occurred at Weola and Nukabura waterholes where hundreds of other people were indiscriminately slaughtered. It is from this historical backdrop of what and slaughter of my descendants and of the disenfranchisement of the survivors of that era that my father and myself have encountered new enemy in recent times, equally as sinister and brutal as those of Trellis era, in the form of black and white operatives in the native title arena. My father Jim Hagen went from chair of his colourly traditional owner group, a position he was elected unopposed at an authorisation meeting to be dumped as chair on the grounds he couldn't prove his apical links to country. It wasn't so much that my father couldn't prove his links as that was never an issue of contention. 
It was that Aboriginal leaders within the native title network found him too problematic to work with. He insisted on reading all the documents requiring his signature for explanation or mining for, for exploration or mining activity on country by the representative body. And when he failed to acquiesce, they came up with an original approach of questioning his links to country. It wasn't until I threatened to derail Cullerley's native title determination for filing a separate land claim for the same parcel of land in the federal court, the senior members of the native title representative body miraculously found evidence that did link my father and implicitly all, the, all of Trello's ancestors to Cullerley country. After gaining a native title through the federal court determination on 2 July 2014 in Thargaminda, I was elected in a six-person committee at an inaugural colourly prescribed body corporate AGM on 6 December 2014 in Brisbane and then elected by that committee as their chairperson on 13 January 2015 in the same city for a period of four years. Having had first-hand experience of witnessing Trella's name being struck off the colourly apical descendants list registered by the courts because a white anthropologist at the behest of her political black masters said she had proof to link her to another tribe was stressful and problematic for me and the entire Hagen family. Our family's protestation had been vindicated with me as the family's representative banning a mandate by our people to head their organisation. I'm in accord with and have first an experience of the succinct words of Indigenous academic Professor Aileen Morton Robinson who argues confirmation of Indigenous presence in the landscape is dependent on the words of white people. Whiteness is centred by setting the criteria for proof and the standards for credibility. Professor Martin Nakata, a Torres Strait Islander, said he too was frustrated by the implication from white officials of getting it wrong as a writer because Islanders' understanding of events via the oral tradition, popular memory, distorts, exaggerates, misunderstands, fabricates or simply forgets the actual facts of what was experienced. Despite John Batman entering into a treaty with traditional owners in the Port Phillip district in 1835, an act Governor Burke declared as void of no effect as, it, as against the rights of the Crown, Australian government officials have never acknowledged, prior to Marvo, that Aboriginal people were the sovereign owners of this nation. Mind you, Batman's treaty issue was never about whether he had consent for his action of the governing body of the time, but rather the hierarchy didn't want a precedent set by any landowner acknowledging in a formal sense that Aborigines had any claims to any lands in Australia. The Malupam v Namalco Proprietary Limited the Gov Land Rights case, native title claim before Justice Richard Blackburn in the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory in 1975, was emphatically rejected on a number of issues of law and fact. At the end of the day, Justice Blackburn couldn't bring himself to contradict the perfect conveniently fa convenient fallacy of terra nullius, that the land did not belong to anyone at the time of British settlement. The doctrine of terra nullius was overruled by the High Court in Marbo v Queensland No. 2 on 3 June 1992 that recognised Miriam people of the Murray Island and the Torres Strait as native title holders. The Marbo case that ran for a decade and was led by passionate land rights advocate Eddie Kwoki Mabo, produced a decision by the High Court that recognised Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have rights to the land, rights that exist before the British arrived and can still exist today. Chief Justice Jared Brennan in the Mabo landmark decision asserted, it is imperative in today's world that the common law should neither be or be seen to be frozen in an age of racial discrimination. The fiction by which the rights and interests of indig indigenous inhabitants and in land were treated as non-existent was justified by a policy which has no place in contemporary law of this country. But still the push by those from the right of Australian politics in the form of Liberal Democrat uh, David Lanehelm, who said in the past month, there may have been people in Australia prior to the Aborigines and argues there were some anthropologists who supported that position. When pressed for by the media to identify the anthropologists who supported his theory, he could not name them or their credentials. So what are the lessons learned from this paper? One, 
that we are all inherently biased along racial lines. Two, that the nurturing process of races from a bygone, bygone era is affirmation in action as demonstrated by politicians who conveniently play the race card for political expediency. Three, that there are black and white operatives in the native title business who would sell their morals and cultural integrity to advance themselves and their cause. Four, there are a growing number of non-Indigenous people in this country who support equity and justice for First Nations people and have demonstrated that conviction to the benefit of those they advocate for. Five, that native title and mining can coexist and prosper if greed at the expense of just recompense by mining executives is not promoted, flaunted and realised. Six, that to acknowledge subliminal whiteness as the elephant in the room is the first step to remove potential landmines on the road to amicable coexistence of native title holders and mining companies executives. In conclusion, I'd like to say that there is now a window of opportunity for native title holders and mining executives to forge a healthy alliance where the wrongs of the past can be factored into the creation of new strategies for future businesses that leads to a just outcome where we all benefit from the wealth derived from our lands. Thank you.